at these press releases and corporations. Let's, instead of talking about old and new media, mm -hmm. yeah. talk about corporate media mm -hmm. and public media. Bob McChesney, you say the crisis didn't come with, oh, the Internet is just putting newspapers out of business. Explain that divide and what you think has brought journalism to where it is today. There's been a long-term tension between private ownership of media and the public good that is journalism, what we need to govern our own lives. And it, it really, a hundred years ago, first became a major crisis, and that led, as newspapers became monopolized in city after city, and you only had one or two newspapers in most cities in the country by the second or third decade of the century, except in the largest cities. And the solution then was the idea of professional journalism that would sort of erect this barrier between the newsroom and the owners and the advertisers. So you could, it wouldn't matter if you only had one newspaper in a town, because professional journalists wouldn't be influenced by their owners or advertisers. They'd be trained at J schools, journalism schools, to do the right thing. And that system worked for better or for worse into the middle or second, the final third of this last century. But what happened then is you saw the increasing conglomerization, concentration, takeover of newsrooms, both broadcast and print, by large chains. And they basically found in monopolistic environments they could gut newsrooms and get away with it because no one had any alternative. So we saw the diminution of resources to newsrooms, the closing of Washington bureaus, of foreign bureaus, of statehouse bureaus, began in earnest in the 1980s and accelerated greatly in the 1990s, long before Google existed, long before the Internet. Mm -hmm. By the time the Internet came along, what it did is it just sort of pushed over the tottering giant. It accelerated the process. It made it permanent, but it didn't create it, nor will it solve it on its own. Now, you have um, some solutions, uh, some unusual solutions that you posit uh, in your book in terms of how uh, the uh, the country can invest in the infrastructure of news dissemination uh, for, for the public. Could you talk about some sure. of those solutions? We'll try. And uh, one thing that we're trying to do with this book, though, is open a dialogue, not close it. We think we have ideas. We want to throw them in the mix. But we throw them into the mix primarily to get people thinking about it and to say to citizens, you can be part of this discourse about the media that you want in the 21st century. You can have more democracy now. So you can have more open media, Boston.org, all these institutions. But you have to figure out how to support them. There's great people out there trying to do it, but they're starving. How do we feed them? And one of the things we suggest is that we're losing a generation of young journalists right now, kids who want to go into this craft, who love it, for the same reasons that you and you went in some a few years ago. And and. We have in America now a, a uh, AmeriCorps, where we say to a kid who wants to teach, you can go into a community, uh, underserved rural or urban community, and start teaching there, and the government will provide a little bit of a stipend, some support. Why not a news AmeriCorps, where we send young people into communities to work at community radio stations, to work uh, in, to develop news sites in underserved places, maybe to supercharge a high school radio station, something like that. And why not, at the same time, supercharge funding uh, to begin to get to something akin to European levels uh, for public media, uh, public broadcasting, and especially community stations around this country. There's, there are simple things we could start doing right now, and these are not recreating the wheel. These are, these are really policy choices. What are those European models? How much do they put into public media? Bob well, that, I think the research we did in the book was really mind-boggling and eye-opening. Let's start with the American tradition first. Our own tradition in the first half of the 19th century, we wanted to compute you know, this federal subsidy from the post office, which primarily was the distribution arm of newspapers, that's 95 percent of its traffic, and the printing subsidies in the first half of the 19th century, how significant were they? And so we actually went back and determined what percentage of GDP they were in the first half of the 19th century. If we had the same percentage of gross domestic product today by the federal government as a subsidy of journalism, how much would the federal government pay? And it was $30 billion. I mean, it was such an enormous investment by the federal government to create a free press. It wasn't just a piddly side thing. It was, after military, the largest expense of the federal government for the first 75 years of our history into the Civil War period. And then we went to look at other, you know, generally when people ask about government subsidies, they think of Nazi Germany, Stalinist Russia, Pol Pot. They think of all these terrible dictatorships. And we said, well, that's not really the relevant comparison for the United States. We should look at other democracies. What are they doing in Europe and in Asia and even in third world countries that are democracies? And what we discovered is all of them, or almost all of them, have significantly large public media, community media, and journalism subsidies. They vary from country to the country, but they're all enormous compared to the United States. And if you look at Northern Europe, for example, uh, this average country up there in Scandinavia or Holland or Germany, in U.S. terms, if you put it to a per capita basis and put it in the United States, we'd have to spend between 20 and 35 billion dollars a year to subsidize.
subsidize public media and journalism to be equal to those countries. And if I can just add, that figure sounds like a lot of money, especially when everybody in Washington is telling us that we're broke. That's about 12 weeks of the war in Iraq. Uh, that's about 4 or 5 percent of the first bank bailout. And I would just suggest to you that when you go out and talk to Americans and tell them, for this investment, you can avoid the next war in Iraq. You can avoid the next big bank bailout because we will really have information to serve a civic and democratic purposes rather than commercial entertainment. You'd be blown away by the extent that they get it. There's a great disregard for the American people, especially in this issue. When we've been traveling around the country, we've been blown away by the extent to which citizens are scared and concerned. They're afraid that we're moving towards something very akin to a propaganda state, and they want to make sure that they have the information to govern. And it, that, that investment, while it's a big figure, uh, it's a small figure when you look at what's at stake. We're talking to John Nichols and Bob McChesney. We're going to break and then come back. They have co-written The Death and Life of American Journalism, the media revolution that will begin the world again. Stay with us. Column here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guests are John Nichols and Bob McChesney. They both, both founded Free Press, and they've come out with a new book. It's called The Death and Life of American Journalism, The Media Revolution That Will Begin the World Again. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Um, so you talk about subsidies for journalism today. Um, people might be saying, wait, what about the separation of press from the state? Won't that compromise it? Well, you know, Bob it's really the central issue we all care about. I mean, I think there are two great components of free press in the United States in our tradition. The first great component is the one we all know about. The government shouldn't censor content. It shouldn't regulate journalists. It shouldn't prohibit anyone from entering doing media, like any of us. And we that should never be compromised. But the second great tradition of the American free press tradition is it's the first duty of the state to make sure a free press exists. And that part has been lost in the shuffle. One of the striking things we discovered, Amy and Juan, when we did our research is we reread all the First Amendment cases at the U.S. Supreme Court in the last hundred years, all the freedom of the press cases. And what was striking in Hugo Black and Potter Stewart and all the great cases was the assumption that it was the first duty of a democratic government to make sure a credible fourth estate exists. Otherwise, the 